Hello everyone, this is Stephen Spoonmore coming to you with this presentation on cervical manipulation risks versus reward. You can see the objectives for the presentation there. Take a moment to read those. So the first question is, what is uh, cervical thrust manipulation? Dr. Tim Flynn defines that it should not look like martial arts. And the APTA's Manipulation Education Committee gives us the, the definition we're all familiar with. It is a high velocity, low amplitude therapeutic movements within or at the end range of motion. I think a key statement there is that it is a therapeutic movement. Uh, it is a component of a large plan of care, uh, one piece of the treatment puzzle, if you will, and not um, typically used in isolation, uh, but as a component with perhaps a soft, some soft tissue mobilization or other joint mobilizations, exercises leading up to and then proceeding following the thrust manipulation so that it seamlessly flows into uh, the mechanism and the plan of care. There is a web page there with other resources listed on thrust manipulation that talk about some of the the legal aspects um, and definitions etc that are there valuable resources I encourage everyone uh, to take a look get an example of uh, what uh, Tim Flynn uh, means by what cervical thrust manipulation should not look like. Uh, you can see the tension built up in both the practitioner and the patient, if you will. Uh, the amount of force that would be required to effectuate any kind of uh, change in the tissue would be enormous and thus is not what we are hoping to reproduce in the clinic. Uh, it should look much more like this. Uh, notice the relaxed state of the patient there. Um, she looks quite comfortable. Um, the practitioner's hands are relaxed. You can see there's not any buildup of tension. Notice the, the bottom arm on the left arm is supporting her, her cranium, uh, providing a, a firm stop. So this looks to be set up to perform an upper cervical, uh, perhaps an AA rotational manipulation, in which case uh, that sudden movement, quick movement to the left will be stopped by the practitioner's arm preventing any uh, movement beyond what would be safe to perform. The one caution here, and we'll talk about this a little later in the presentation, would be um, that the patient really should have their eyes open or at least um, an opportunity for the, the clinician to view the patient's eyes looking for an astagmus, any changes um, in vision or pupillary response that may indicate uh, a warning sign that uh, we need to back off and and go to a different uh, direction. In 2014, the American Heart Association um, put out a statement on uh, cervical thrust manipulation and this is one paragraph, one component of it. Um, I, it's linked into the references of this presentation. I, I hope everyone has had, if you have not had opportunity, take opportunity to read the entire statement. But uh, this for our purpose uh, today is the piece that uh, perhaps is most relevant. And, and I won't read it to you, but just notice the piece that's underlined there. That although cervical thrust manipulation is not well, the relationship between that and cervical artery dissection is not well established and probably low, Nonetheless, um, they advocate that practitioners should strongly consider the possibility of cervical artery disease as a presenting symptom and that the patient should be informed of the statistical association between it. Okay, 
American Chiropractic Association is quick to point out um, of putting that risk, uh, as the American Heart Association stated, into perspective. This is a slide taken from their website um, stating the overall risk of death from a spinal surgery is 1,800 1, per 1 million uh, versus the risk of serious side effects or death from a cervical spine surgery, 500 per 1 million. Uh, and then the risk of uh, combined use of NSAIDs and aspirin is 153 per 1 million. Uh, the risk of death from aspirin alone being 25 per 1 million. And then their associated risk between neck manipulation and stroke is less than 1 per million. Now I find it quite curious that they had to estimate their numbers all the way up to 1 million uh, in order to bring the, the risk of stroke down to less than 1. Um, we're all familiar with ways to manipulate statistics and numbers to make them say or appear to say what is in our best interest. Um, and so on the American Heart Association side, we have uh, one statement, very bold statement, stating that we should strongly consider that cervical thrust manipulation, um, the cervical artery disease rather, should be a presenting symptom of our patients coming to the clinic with neck pain, and thus that cervical thrust manipulation should be used with extreme caution versus the American Chiropractic Association who points out, hey look, we do this all the time um, and they advocate that it is much safer than the medical interventions that are out there. The American Physical Therapy Association put out the following uh, response. This is a piece of it written again by Dr. Tim Flynn uh, where he you know, states that uh, physical therapists ad admit and we recognize that uh, manipulation on very rare occasions has been associated with cerebrovascular accidents or strokes uh, and that we have a framework from which to operate from and we'll look at that framework um, towards the end of this presentation today as uh, developed by the IFOMT. So if we take a step back then, we can see this dichotomization on, on two fronts from the medical community and the American Heart Association, um, raising warnings, warning flags and, and strong warnings versus the Chiropractic Association that continues to uh, almost uh, mitigate and, and continue on with, uh, with little deterrent um, in the, the use of thrust manipulation. And it's such a political, uh, politi politically charged issue. Uh, where do the numbers really lie? And that's a, we'll hope to investigate that a little bit uh, in the next few moments. Um, what is the estimated risk of a serious advers adverse event? And you can see some numbers that have been put there from different studies. Uh, the very bottom, you know, a reasoned estimate of stroke from a chiropractic manipulation, the best estimate we can determine from what literature is out there, likely 1.3 per 100,000. When we take into consideration, though, the estimated risk of stroke altogether, uh, according to a presentation listed by Dr. Uh, Tim Flynn, that this risk of 1.3 per 100,000 is not is significantly different than the overall risk for stroke um, in, in a patient population who is at risk for it. Um, so again, the, the waters are still a bit muddy um, and difficult for us to ascertain what the true um, risk is of the, having a serious adverse event with cervical thrust manipulation. What's the public's perception of this? Uh, we see it uh, as just as dichotomized in the public's perception as it is in the medical community. Um, a, uh, articles uh, after the American Heart Association's press release came out and newspapers and news reports throughout the country um, had headlines such as the one from Fox News that neck manipulations may be associated with stroke, all the way to um, those patients we've all met and encountered individuals who um, swear by chiropractic care that it is uh, the best thing that they've ever encountered and done um, and yeah, that's the cartoon at the bottom. <laughs> 
So what is the, the real risk? In 2012, uh, Puente Dora et al. did a systematic review of all the published cases in peer review literature they could identify from 1950 all the way to 2010 looking for adverse events with associated with cervical thrust manipulation uh, and you can see the definition they provided um, on the slide there um, taking into account that these are events of medium to long-term duration so this excludes the post-treatment soreness that lasts 24 hours a very temporary uh, increase in pain etc that then resolved uh, on its own these are the adverse events being defined as those things that persisted, that lasted, that required further treatment, that were distressing to the patient. And they classified um, these uh, patients as being appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, and you can see examples listed on the slide there as to how they uh, identified this. Um, obviously, they are looking at this from a perspective that many of us are familiar with from the physical therapy um, literature and world and how we would classify a patient as being appropriate versus inappropriate. Um, those that they included those being inappropriate, those that uh, we may find our chiropractic colleagues that will... Um, treat with cervical thrust manipulation for other non neuromuscular skeletal disorders such as asthma, um, earaches and infections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those uh, pointed or at all deemed to be inappropriate for cervical thrust manipulation in their review. They did exclude any spontaneous event, uh, which there are quite a number of those identified in the literature, things such as um, have being in the, in the dental chair, uh, being at the hairdresser, having the, your hair shampooed, uh, sporting events, etc. Those were excluded. The other um, thing they classified were, were the adverse events. Were they considered preventable? Were they unpreventable? Or if there was insufficient information, then they classified them as being unknown. Uh, so those that were preventable, uh, that red flags were present that should have prevented further um, therapy. The clinician should have uh, been able to identify that there were warning signs and, and stopped. Um, for example, a continuation of manipulative therapy uh, when more than five treatment sessions with no change or a worsening in symptoms um, certainly would be considered a preventable um, event. Um, and if it was unpreventable, that there was nothing identified in the exam that which would have cl clued the clinician that an adverse event was pending. So what were the events that they identified? Uh, you can see 37% of the cases were cervical artery dissection. The, um, the number one cause, the one that uh, the American Heart Association warns us so strongly about. Uh, disc herniation was another uh, event that occurred in 18% of the cases. Um, stroke occurred 13% of the cases, and there were there were some uh, numbers, uh, five cases of a vertebral dislocation or a fracture that was caused. So this is a slide taken directly from Puente Dora's, um a chart from from their study. Um, and we could spend quite a bit of time looking at these numbers and affecting them in a number of different ways. But if we'll just point out for a moment, if we look at the patients that were deemed appropriate, so they had a clear presentation for which thrust manipulation would be appropriate, um, and yet there were 80% of those, or 48 cases, in which the adverse event should have been prevented based on something that occurred in the medical screening or the, the examination that should have clued the therapist or the clinician, the doctor, whoever it was, into understanding that there was some reason to not proceed. The further medical screening was warranted. Only in 13 cases um, was there no clear indication that there was a reason to stop, and those were the ones that were deemed unpreventable. In my opinion, this is really um, our estimate of the real risk.
uh, with cervical thrust manipulation is this is the number that there was no clear indication of how to prevent this um, from occurring. If we look at the patients that were inappropriate, again, these, these were patients for which cervical thrust manipulation uh, likely should never have been on the table to start with. Um, and we can see that 20% or 12 of those cases uh, were identified as being preventable um, and only one that would have been unpreventable. But again, I go back to the argument that if thrust manipulation really was inappropriate to start with, um, why was that uh, not preventable? Um, now, one uh, caveat to consider, a very important thing we need to understand, if we look down at the unknown column, we can see that there were just as many uh, of those patients total that w as there were in the preventable category. So there's a very 4% of these patients that there was insufficient data documented for them to really identify was it preventable or unpreventable, uh, were the patients appropriate or inappropriate for treatment. So um, although this gives us uh, quite a bit of information, it, we have to take it with a grain of salt and understand that these numbers could be significantly higher uh, if we take an intention to, to treat type analysis and, and carry those numbers forward, they, they could significantly higher, they could be significantly lower um, had we had a, a fully and complete data set. Um, but it does give us an idea that we can begin to reduce the likelihood of an adverse event through appropriate and proper medical screening. Uh, if we go back to those patients that they did a deem were the adverse events were preventable, we look at 30 of them, or 50% of those that were preventable, they had a pre-existing pathology. Uh, 21 of those had an active bony pathology, such as severe spondylos spondylosis, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, or cervical stenosis. Four of them had vascular problems, uh, such as a history of cardiac infarction, arthrosclerosis of the cervical arteries. Uh, then there were some miscellaneous categories, uh, one associated with pregnancy, uh, other from chronic symptoms from motor vehicle accident decades prior um, that had compromised to the cervical arterial system, and then uh, another with a symptomatic disc pathology that worsened following the manipulation. You know, what's the take-home message from Punta Dora's um, study? If the patient's not improving, if things don't look right, stop. Um, because in 15 cases, 24% of those with an adverse event occurred after five or more manipulations with either no change or a worsening of symptoms. Uh, back to our test and retest model that we identify our asterisk signs, our comparable signs, we initiate the treatment, we go back and we recheck and look to see if things are improving or not. And after five sessions, if you're of anything, of an exercise, of whatever it is, if your patient's not improving, there should be a serious introspective reflection and examination as to whether something was missed um, and, and some further clarification needs to take place. Um, what were the symptoms that the patients with these adverse events experienced? You can see this is a breakdown of the frequency of those. Uh, in 59 cases of the 134 patients, there was weakness, 53 reported paresthesias, and 43 of 34 had increased pain. Uh, 32 of them had vertigo and also 32 that had gait disturbances. So it gives us a snapshot of what these uh, patients with these adverse events, what were the big findings that they, that they had. If we go in and take a closer look at the etiology of cervical artery dissection itself, this is another systematic review done by Handelin and Lakovich in 2005, looking at 606 cases off of 20 published articles uh, on that specifically had patients that had a cervical artery dissection, and they looked to see what was the breakdowns. 
54% uh, of those cases were involved the internal carotid artery, 46% involved the vertebral artery, 61% uh, of, of those were considered spontaneous. And we'll see a, a slide in just a moment on what some of those uh, spontaneous activities uh, may involve. 30% um, of them were associated with a trauma or a quote-unquote trivial trauma, a minor trauma. And, and only notice that only 9% of these 606 cases were had any association with cervical spinal manipulation. Uh, so a large, large, large number of these cases um, came from other causes and other sources, and even uh, s more than half of them were considered spontaneous uh, without any precipitating event. What were uh, some of these um, activities that were associated with these cervical um, dissections? You can see things such as sporting activities, leisure activities, um, a sustained <coughs> rotation or extension, short-lived uh, and or rotation or extension, sudden head movements, uh, minor trauma such as a fall or banging their head, uh, and then there were some miscellaneous uh, ones such as uh, instability, a uh, patient who was postpartum, uh, one who was post-gastrectomy, uh, which is interesting. Um, so you can see the total number of cases they identified there um, were uh, 58 that were this um, trivial uh, trauma, if you will. So other reasons and other activities in which uh, cervical artery dissection may occur. I think this is something to keep in mind when talking to our patients about risks and benefits and providing informed consent that um, these daily activities in which we all engage on a regular basis have also been associated uh, with cervical artery dissection and surely we we go through these um, every day and, and millions of people do these activities on a daily basis without any uh, adverse events um, and so, so to help put the things into context that when we're able to appropriately screen the patient and identify that we feel that, that we're confident this is a safe procedure for them we're, we're taking as much of the risk away as we possibly can um, then then be able to proceed forward uh, with a discussion such as that Um, and back to the comparable risks, uh, so we saw the, the American Chiropractic Association slide there where they, they, they put the cervical thrust manipulation in comparison with uh, death rates of NSAIDs and aspirin and cervical um, surgery, etc. Um, a few other statistics that are out there, uh, you know, the patients who regularly use NSAIDs, 25 to 4.5% of those per year will develop a clinically relevant problem that they'll have some sort of adverse event. And seven, there's a 7.4% mortality rate from GI complications in the use of chronic use of NSAIDs. We can even see the sudden cardiac arrest occurs in 0.7 to 3 per 100,000 athletes under the age of 35. Um, so it's just some other numbers, some other things. Let's put these things into, con into consideration. Again, we said that reasonable estimate of cervical thrust manipulation causing adverse event or, or stroke, I think was specifically, was 1.3 per 100,000. The reality is uh, you may be more likely to have a sudden cardiac arrest um, in a young athlete than you are for that individual to develop um, a cervical artery dissection. Um, epidural injections, which are quite popular, uh, can see have some significant risks associated with them. Um, and I'll, you can read for yourselves there the st stats and the numbers there. Cervical artery disease. So what really are these signs and symptoms that, that we're worried about? As we're going through our history, our clinical exam, what are these uh, red flag uh, warning lights that should be going off in our mind? Um, often patients will present with two or more. Um, so they, they usually come more often, they will be more than just one symptom that they'll have. Um, some patients, however, can be completely asymptomatic. And again, back to there are a certain number of these that are unpreventable. There is some inherent risk uh, with a thrust manipulation that 
and there is a certain inherent risk with anything we do in life. Uh, so we have to be able and willing to proceed um, in in the context of a risk versus benefit ratio. Uh, often the ischemic symptoms come on after the non-ischemic symptoms. So let's define. what those are. Our non-ischemic symptoms uh, may include uh, Horner syndrome or postile tinnitus, these lower cranial nerve uh, signs. Uh, less commonly you can see other things listed on the, uh, the slide there. And those will often precede the ischemic ones. So the ischemic symptoms um, would be a T, um, an ischemic stroke, um, retinal infarction, or the amaurosis em fugax, uh, which is a, a loss of vision to one eye due to a restriction of blood flow. Uh, so I'm looking at this, and I'm seeing, well, these ischemic, these are pretty blatantly obvious uh, that if the patient is displaying these neurological signs and symptoms, um, those are definite. Uh, stop, do not pass go, do not collect $200. Let's uh, route this person appropriately to the medical professionals and likely a call uh, to 911 and immediate transportation is, is in the works. Um, the ones that we're, we're more likely to encounter are going to be these more subtle non-ischemic signs and symptoms um, in which case our clinical reasoning skills, our, our, our ability to perform the, the appropriate tests and measures um, and appropriate interviewing in order to help identify those signs and symptoms become very key. Breaking out um, the two common uh, things we'll see as far as cervical artery disease is concerned, we have the vertebral basilar system and then we have the uh, carotid system. There are some subtle differences because the blood flow goes to different parts of the brain. And so the, the signs and symptoms will be slightly different. Um, the VBI, as is what uh, traditionally we have uh, been taught or drilled on, uh, many of us probably learned the pneumonic of the five Ds and the three Ns. I remember that this artery supplies the hindbrain. And so we'll see uh, signs and symptoms such as the nystagmus, gait disturbances, and the back to Horner syndrome, uh, refresher there, that that's a drooping of the eyelid, constriction of the pupil, uh, often a bloodshot eye may accompany it, the sinking of the eyeball, and the anhydrosis, which is a decreased sweating on one side of the face. So those are more of our signs and symptoms of vertebral basilar insufficiency. Uh, some other symptoms we may see are listed on the slide there. Again, these are all uh, the, the common things we've been grilled and learned about uh, th throughout our, our therapy education. Always a good to review, though. The clinical presentation, you know, what often does it present like? Uh, the first symptom may be a pain in the back of the neck. Uh, and 50% of those um, patients with vertebral basilar insufficiency report, uh, that is one of their, their chief complaints is this pain in the back of the neck. They can very much mimic a, a mechanical neck pain. Often 67%, uh, two-thirds will have an occipital headache that spreads as a ram's horn. Again, a very calm presentation that we treat very successfully. Um, can be an early on, uh, presentation of vertebral basal insufficiency. So patients that come in with neck pain and headache, um, we should be um, asking questions and walk into that exam with some index of suspicion. Uh, often described as, sharp, as excuse me, throbbing or sharp. Rarely is it mistaken as a migraine in those people who have true migraine headaches. Uh, Up to percent of patients report that it is pain like any other. Uh, and uh, again, the ischemic symptoms can be delayed up to two weeks. So we may see that this presentation comes on weeks prior to um, any of the true ischemic symptoms coming on. What about the internal carotids? 
Uh, so again, the 80% of the blood flow going to the brain comes through the carotid uh, arteries. It will often present with this triad of pain, Horner's syndrome, and the ischemia. Um, often there's pain, uh, but however that triad, although described and you'll see it written in the literature as this is what internal carotid disease looks like, uh, only 33% of cases present with that actual classic triad. Uh, so there are a lot more patients who will develop internal carotid disease uh, that don't fit that classic presentation. Uh, often there's pain on one side uh, that is persistent and biased. It can be unilateral uh, into the facial, dental, and orbital pain in about 50% of patients. 67% of patients will report it as being a constant steady ache or a throb. Uh, and most do consider that this is like any other pain that they've experienced. Uh, onset has been documented uh, on average of nine days, but can be as long as 90 days. Uh, there's a documented case in the literature uh, before any neurological symptoms came on um, that these symptoms began. So again, the patient that comes in with uh, facial pain, that comes in with this um, headache, uh, the, these, this presentation that may mimic other musculoskeletal conditions that we treat quite readily and with great efficacy, our index of suspicion should remain elevated uh, until we can uh, safely or, or confidently um, rule these issues out. Uh, again, uh, fewer than 50% of patients will present with uh, the Horner syndrome. So, can we accurately screen? Can we accurately rule out that a patient has a cervical artery disease and or a dissection in progress? Um, Hutting et al. in 2012 did a systematic review um, found that the quality of the studies out there were questionable. Um, and that pre-manipulative tests done prior to thrust manipulation, ex uh, for example, the extension rotation or rotation at end range, that their sensitivities were pretty poor, ranging from 0 to 57%. And again, in a test whose uh, function is to rule out a condition. We want a very, very strong sensitivity so that we can definitively rule out, uh, rule out with confidence uh, that that can is going on. And these tests simply just don't have it. Um, so the bottom line is there are a high number of false negatives. There are people who would clear those tests, but yet they still have um, this cervical artery disease or perhaps even a dissection in progress. So uh, using those those pre-manipulative tests of taking the patient in end range extension and end range rotation and extension uh, are really not advocated any longer. Uh, what is advocated, let me back up for just a second, what should we do? Uh, we, we do our thorough medical history and screening. We look for those things that we've already talked about, understanding those signs and symptoms, uh, and then what if we do suspect it and um, we stop and we ensure that um, we ask ourselves that question, what's the risk or the benefit of continuing the exam and initiating treatment in this patient? We'll see in a few minutes um, the uh, recommendations from IFOMPT um, on how to proceed and putting these things into that risk-benefit ratio. Um, certainly, if it is an emergent condition, uh, if the patient is developing those ischemic signs and symptoms, then they need to be to the emergency room. They need to be to their primary care physician ASAP. Um, if it is non-emergent, if they're stable, uh, then um, that's where the, the clinical decision making, a conversation with the patient, a call to the physician, um, and a ver identify what is the next step. Um, very likely, uh, those working, those of us in a direct access environment, um, should be advocating or pushing if we have the ability to do so, um, ensuring that we're getting appropriate imaging for these patients to begin to now diagnose and to rule in uh, that there is uh, such a condition that we're concerned about. Um, a carotid ultrasound is very good sensitivity.
when there is a severe vascular stenosis. So we can again, we can draw on the carotid ultrasound to definitively rule out that it is a severe problem. However, um, if it's a mild stenosis, its sensitivity is still not very good. So um, caution has continued to be warranted there. A CT scan has very specific, uh, and so if um, can need to rule in that it really is a cervical artery disease, uh, then the CT scan is probably the recommended modality of choice to do that. Let's switch gears for a minute. Um, what about upper cervical instability? So often there are there are, we look at the red flags for thrust manipulation. They really fall in, under an umbrella of, of two sides. One would be the cervical artery disease. The other being this instability. Um, so upper cervical instability is associated with rheumatoid arthritis, and that's the most common uh, thing we see documented in the literature. Ankylosing spondylitis also has a, a high association. Uh, Down syndrome, congenital defects, laxity following head or neck infection, uh, rare, uh, and trauma. Um, What are signs and symptoms of this? Uh, well, first off, we, we need to understand that it may mimic cervical artery disease. We may see s many of the same things that we've discussed already. Um, and again, if you're identifying, if you're seeing, we're seeing those signs and symptoms, it's, uh, if we can point our the physician down the, the pathway to understand that, hey, we're, we're more concerned about an instability versus we're, we're concerned about a cervical artery disease, that's great, and I think they would appreciate that information. Um, nonetheless, if, if you're identifying that there are these flat things are not right, um, the conversation is essentially going to be the same. Um, but back to what are the neurological symptoms we may be seeing with instability? A headache, dizziness, buzzing in the ears, uh, dysphagia. Neurological signs may include hyperreflexia, our gait disturbances, spasticity. Some other signs and symptoms uh, more specific to um, upper cervical instability may be a lip paresthesia with head movements or loss of balance related to head and neck movements. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, um, one uh, finding that may come across is this reduced and then increased range of motion upon retest, uh, which should strongly raise some suspicions. Uh, it may indicate a basilar invagination. In other words, the brain stem um, the dens rather is being pushed up brain stem. Um, not a good thing. Uh, maybe it likely will be accompanied with facial sensory disturbances with dysphagia and with the lower, lower cranial nerve involvement as you can imagine. How do we um, proceed to examine uh, the ligamentous stability? So we have a patient who we're suspicious of based on the history that there may be some upper cervical ligamentous instability. Uh, we need to precaution. We want to proceed with caution because the last thing uh, we wish to do is to worsen their condition. Uh, and so the uh, process, the uh, recommended process would be to begin with active patient generated movements and then moving into our passive therapist generated movement. So having the patient move to where they feel comfortable, they feel confident, and if uh, there are no ad additional warning signs uh, you feel appropriate, then to add the therapist directed movement or the overpressure if you will. Um, and then lastly to test the passive accessory movements following these physiological movements uh, and then incorporate ligamentous testing within the risk and benefits ratio um, as needed. When we look at some of the specific ligament to special tests that are out there, uh, the sharp purser test, uh, for example, ALAR ligament stress test, atlantoaxial and tectoral membranes, uh, these were uh, looked at in the, uh, the article by heading referenced at the top there. It was a systematic review.
looking at the quality of these special tests for identifying uh, cervical instability. And you can see the numbers listed on the slide, particularly at the bottom, the lantoaxial membrane and the tectoral membrane test. The numbers look pretty good. Uh, again, these are screening tests, so we want the sensitivity numbers to be very high. Notice that they are specific, so able to rule in um, the conditions, which uh, may be beneficial for us, but often our, our intent really is to rule out that there is um, this condition so that we are feel confident in proceeding with our, our interventions. However, when we take a, a closer look at the, the study, um, we can see that most of the tests were actually only evaluated one time. So in other words, there was one published study that included uh, these tests, the exception being the sharp pressure test. Sharp pressure test has been uh, studied numerous times, uh, and thus you see the wider range of uh, sensitivity and specificity levels, excuse me, um, because it has been investigated on more than one occasion. Uh, there was significant bias in the studies. Uh, the quality was uh, not the best. Um, and the comparison they made was mostly with radiographs. Uh, which have their own flaws to them. Uh, the radiology community um, notes that they have inadequate test and retest capabilities. So you can take an image and then uh, have the patient move around, come back, take another image, uh, and the test retest um, is not uh, the best. It's not really a good. It's not a good gold standard to compare these clinical tests to. So the conclusion from Hudding et al. was that we conclude that screening for upper cervical instability cannot be done accurately at the moment. Um, what do we do? How do we proceed in the face of uncertainty? Back to our clinical examination, our history taking, um, and then putting things into context as we find them. Um, certainly continuing to use our, our upper cervical uh, tests as needed and, and when appropriate, uh, but putting that grain of salt uh, into it and taking a step back and investigating does this match what we're suspicious it is. If we do identify a patient that we believe does have upper cervical instability, uh, the first step would be uh, flexion extension lateral radiographs. And what we're looking here is for the atlantodental interval of more than two and a half or more than three millimeters uh, is considered to be significant. Uh, and that is an indication of an unstable joint. Uh, the next slide we'll look at actually shows a, a picture of, of what we're measuring on this so you can get an idea. The other um, radiographs to consider, in case, so in case of consideration of a fracture, um, is an open mouth, open mouth odontoid view in which we can identify a fracture of the dens or the transverse processes. Uh, certainly this, in the case of uh, trauma, would be indicated. Um, in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, however, we can see that there can be um, spontaneous fractures of the dens as it de degenerates. And so um, it may also be uh, indicated to look at this open mouth odontoid view. Um, a CT scan really is recommended uh, as the definitive way to uh, rule in uh, these conditions. So here's uh, a radiograph here looking at the atlantodental interview. The yellow arrow is what we're looking at. Uh, and in this case, it does show a subluxation. So you take the measurement from the most anterior uh, part uh, of the of the dens and the most posterior part. Mo I'm sorry, the most anterior part of the vertebral body and the most posterior part of the dens. Uh, and that measurement, if it's more than three millimeters, um, is certainly significant and demonstrates uh, some upper cervical instability. So we've gone into some depth at looking at the 
the two pathways for um, likely adverse events with cervical thrust manipulation, uh, those being cervical artery disease, those being upper cervical instability, and talk briefly about what to do if we're suspicious of those and how to put it into context. Taking a step back, looking at the forest now and not the individual trees, what are the contraindications for a thrust manipulation? When should we be taking it off the table uh, in general? Um, these are things that we're all familiar with. We've, we've been through. We learned these in, in school. Um, but a, again, a refresher is always beneficial to bring those things forefront to our mind. The bottom line is any pathology that leads to a weakening of the bone, we should be taking uh, a step back in and asking ourselves, is it appropriate to proceed with thrust manipulation? Um, a couple of uh, things I highlighted there would be certainly a, a traumatic uh, event that may lead to a fracture, inflammatory events such as a severe rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, one other, uh, for those of us in the Indian Health Service, uh, in particular, we see higher rates of tuberculosis. Um, and so I'd be sure that's part of our screening process. Patients who've had a history of tuberculosis um, have a higher risk of, of an adverse event uh, due to bone weakening um, because of that disease process. So we need to remember that, uh, something that uh, can easily be forgotten at times. Uh, contraindications, um, again, we're looking at what are the neurological contraindications. Cervical myelopathy, uh, the number one uh, spinal cord uh, disorder in patients over the age of 70 is a cervical myelopathy. Um, so, our, again, our elderly patients, is it appropriate for thrust manipulation in a patient over the age of 65 or 70? Um, that's a clinical decision that should be made, probably on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, understand that uh, in that population, we see high rates of cervical myelopathy. Uh, and so some caution and, and definitive uh, appropriate screening should take place. Uh, cord compression, catequina syndrome, and note any nerve root compression with an increasing neurological deficit. Um, so if it's the neurological deficits are worsening, uh, one, we should be taking note of that period, uh, but two, really our thrust manipulation is probably not uh, the most appropriate intervention that, for that patient. Uh, vascular sources here listed, um, don't forget about bleeding disorders, remember we're concerned about the possibility of a cervical artery dissection if there is some um, disruption to the intimal layer of that blood vessel in a patient that does not have good clotting mechanisms. Perhaps they're on a long-term anticoagulant uh, with INR levels with lab values that are, are low um, and we perform that and there is a, a small micro tear of the intimal layer of the blood vessel that may lead to a sequelae of, uh, of bad things. So just something to consider. Uh, certainly a lack of patient consent. And here's where the the medical legal aspect becomes so forefront uh, in, in ensuring that we are communicating effectively with the patient. They're understanding what is going on, what is about to happen, what is happening, what just happened. Uh, and they're okay with it. They're on board with it and providing that consent. Um, and the lastly, if you're unable to get the patient into a proper position, if it's uncomfortable, if it's painful, if there's significant guarding and resistance, stop. Reset, reevaluate, and if you can't get there, don't go there. Um, something is letting you know that this is not uh, an appropriate intervention at this time. Some other relative uh, contraindications you can see there. Uh, osteoporosis is one we're all familiar about. Uh, don't forget about this at the bottom here, the psychological dependence on the high velocity, low amplitude thrust. Go back to the picture we saw at the very beginning of the slideshow of the, uh, the woman uh, positioned for a cervical manipulation who looks so relaxed and so comfortable and pleasing, uh, almost to the point that um, she was seemed very familiar with that treatment technique um, and so are patients who are repeatedly asking for for that who believe that is the only mechanism that will get them better perhaps uh, we need to um, 
take that in accountability. Uh, our goal is not to uh, lead to dependence on uh, any one intervention, but to foster independence and self-efficacy for the patient. You know, what should our clinical exam include? This is just a, a more 30,000 foot, a big picture exam. We, when we're looking at the neurological exam, we're, we're looking at cranial nerves. Our upper motor neuron tests are listed there. Our lower, lower motor neuron tests are, are also listed. Um, so just to put things in proper perspective. Let's visit for just a minute. What do we tell patients? How do we introduce this concept of uh, thrust manipulation? You know, this is merely 100% um, my thoughts uh, based on what we've discussed so far today. Um, I would consider, or I do consider, letting my patients know that, you know, the, the most common side effect from this is you have some increased soreness, a little bit of stiffness, you may feel something, uh, some headache, tiredness, fatigue, or a little bit of discomfort, but you know most patients um, don't, and and they feel better right afterwards. If these do uh, symptoms do come on, they last less than 24 hours. Um, this is a safe technique. Uh, we've identified, looked in, uh, and tried to and looked and identify factors that would raise this risk above um, just playing sports or being involved in any other activities that you normally do and feel confident that um, this is a safe and appropriate technique for you. Uh, and so I, I would approach um, this conversation something like this when when in, uh, in the position and providing some pre-manipulative uh, th um, you know, soft tissue massage or perhaps a mobilization or, or getting the patient into that position then asking them, is, is it okay if I give a quick stretch? Can I just give a little bit of a nudge? And you may feel something go click, you may not feel something go click um, and, and if the patient gives the green light then we proceed. So the, what are the indications for manipulation? We've talked quite a bit about um, contraindications. We've talked about adverse events and the risks, et cetera, et cetera, in order to uh, avoid a uh, nocebo effect. Let's spend a few minutes talking about when is it indicated. Uh, a clinical prediction rule was developed by Puentadora back in 2012. To my knowledge, has not been validated yet. Uh, but what they did, they took 82 consecutive patients, they provided a cervical thrust manipulation and then some range of motion exercise, saw them up to two times over one week, had them rate themselves on a global change, and identified that 39% of the patients, or 32 of the 82, had a successful outcome of plus 5 or better. When they looked in, they identified four attributes that raised the um, post-test probability of success. And those attributes included symptoms for less than 38 days, a positive expectation that manipulation will help, a greater than 10 degree difference in cervical rotation, uh, and painful posterior to anterior mobilizations of the mid-cervical mid spine. Excuse me. Uh, if three or four of the four, three of the four were identified, the positive likelihood ratio was 13.5 and the post-test probability of success raised at 90 percent. So uh, there is there a group of patients for which thrust manipulation is appropriate, is beneficial, is effective? Absolutely there is. Um, so I hope the takeaway from this presentation is not uh, that thrust manipulation uh, is something we should take off the table that um, because there is some inherent risk with it that it should be uh, something that we exclude from our uh, treatment paradigm that we don't pursue uh, as an additional skill if it's not a skill set that we currently possess. Uh, certainly has its place and can be a very effective uh, uh, adjunct uh, piece of our to our toolbox.
mentioned earlier the IFOMPS framework uh, for how to proceed with manual therapy and, and so these are a couple of quotes um, from it. The first we must keep in mind that it is informative and not prescriptive. It is not an algorithm um, with check boxes that say if one, two, and three then do four and five uh, but really is intended to help enhance our clinical reasoning process as we assess and manage the patient. Uh, the other piece that they touch on that they emphasize is that we have to understand that the clinical decision is made in the absence of certainty. There will be risk, there will be uncertainty. We have to be able to navigate that, making our decision by the probabilities at hand. In order to help us do that, um, they add, there's this uh, brief chart that's put together here looking at the risk versus the benefit and then how to act accordingly. So if we see a high number or severe nature of risk factors, then what is the benefit of adding thrust manipulation? Well, it's a very low predicted benefit. So what's the action do we take? We avoid it. If there is a moderate number of risk factors or a moderate nature to the risk factors, and the benefit is moderate, then, well, maybe we should at least delay the treatment and monitor symptoms, reassess prior to incorporating thrust manipulation in um, or uh, other interventions for that matter. Uh, the IFOM framework, uh, back to what if there are low numbers or low nature of risk factors? And if the risk and benefit if it's high, well, then we're probably going to proceed. If it's low risk, but there's also low benefit, again, it's probably not something that we should incorporate um, right away at least, and, and perhaps not at all. Uh, so this chart gives us a, a way to um, put our, our clinical reasoning into perspective and f make the most appropriate choice. What what other uh, thoughts, and this really is uh, are my thoughts, uh, compilation of uh, the information that's been discussed so far. You know, I, I think we, we can reduce the risk of an adverse event. Puente Dora identified that that risk could be mitigated by 44.8% by ruling out the contraindications and the red flags. We can lower that risk of an adverse event. Um, another advocation, uh, particularly uh, Gibbons and Tehan, advocate um, some trial thrusts or uh, another, uh, other models would say to put the patient into the pre-manipulative position, take them into that, uh, that position in which the thrust would occur, monitor symptoms there, check that the patient is doing okay, gets the, give you the verbal consent, and then proceed. Um, certainly you can add, as Gibbons and Dimensions and Tehan would say, as you get into that position, adding some trial thrusts, building up to the actual thrust manipulation. And if uh, the patient continues to give the green light and the signs and symptoms are clear, then you're safe to proceed. Um, it, with that, keep the patient's eyes open so that you can monitor any changes that are occurring in the visual system. Uh, and it also, it, for me, helps me when I'm conscious about I need to check the the patient's eyes, I'm also identifying the rest of the patient's face and I'm not um, forgetting to monitor the patient for any nonverbal cues that may indicate uh, something is, is not right. Um, after we perform the technique, monitor the patient. Uh, when we look at when do these adverse events occur, 72% um, of them occur within minutes and 80% will occur within one hour. So if we monitor the patient for the next several minutes um, or up to an hour depending on what the rest of their therapeutic intervention is going to be for that day, then we can uh, be confident that um, an adverse event will not occur uh, based on the stats there. Um, another uh, point, particularly we go back to the chart from the IFOMP, 
if there's moderate risk factors and there's a moderate benefit to it, then we should probably hold off um, adding that cervical thrust manipulation in uh, after um, till at least visit two. Uh, and perhaps that's a, more of a global blanket statement. There are other ways to affect changes within the cervical spine other than thrust manipulation. Um, thoracic manipulation can be very effective at uh, making some of those changes and we have other you know exercise interventions then and things that can be incorporated day one and hold off on the thrust manipulation to day two the main rationale for that being we look at the duration of the non ischemic signs and symptoms that occur in days to weeks prior to uh, the adverse event therefore um, if we hold off on the thrust manipulation it comes back a few days a week later and there's been no progression of any uh, warning signs or symptoms, we can be more confident that we're not dealing with that cervical artery dissection in my breast. So, bottom line, uh, and I think this is just reiterating what's already been stated, there is some inherent risk. We can reduce the risk and thrust manipulation is effective in managing patients with neck pain and when used appropriate and when and and should be used appropriately um, and can have be a great benefit. Uh, the next slides are of some references. Thank you all for your time. And attention. Um, and I hope everyone has a great day.